And yeah. it, he was like bringing it in and then when it, it hit in and the crowd just going crazy and everything. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, you, you're thinking, but that's something we made in the basement, you know, right. And it has that kind of effect and, and you can get that kind of reaction out of people. That means that you're connecting with them as well. Something you made is connecting with someone else to make them have that kind of reaction. And it's, it's, it's a great feeling. So today is Monday, March 27th, 2023. Who are we speaking with? Uh, this is Doug Smith, one half of 95 North Productions. And Richard Payton, the other half. How did you both meet? Uh, you take that one. <laughs> uh, well, we actually met, <clears throat> excuse me, in college. Uh, we didn't really know each other uh, as such, though. So Doug was three years behind me. And so uh, later on, uh, after college, I started doing music, uh, had a record out, local record in the D.C. area. And then two other frat brothers from UVA asked me to help them with some rap tracks. So we started doing some rap music. And then uh, we brought Doug in as the DJ. And uh, Doug joined the group. And then that's basically uh, how I got to know Doug, you know, one on one more. So that was around uh, it was 89. Yep. 89. Yeah, 89. That's right. And then talk to us the, to the transition to 95 North. So, um, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, no. So, so, you know, as Rich mentioned, we, we, we had a rap group named Trigon with four members <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, we, we tried to, you know, we tried to break into the industry, made demos, we weren't successful. Um, and so around 91, one of the guys in the group said, Hey, I'm done. I'm going to law school. And that was basically the end. But <clears throat> unbeknownst to me, Rich had bought a keyboard and was working on tracks, working on house music tracks. So we had a mutual interest in house music. Um, and so he, he gave me one because we, we actually met in, in Richmond because one of the guys in the group, his parents lives, lives here in Richmond. So we all met at, at at his house, his parents' house, and had a cookout, and it was sort of the official breakup of the group. But Rich handed me a tape at the cookout and said, hey, check these tracks out, you know, let me know what you think. So I took them home and listened to them, and I said, you know, wow, they, they actually sound pretty good. Let me try to write some lyrics, you know, and a melody. Not that I knew how to do that, but I just, you know, listened to it, and you know, eked out a melody and 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 lyrics and sang a a, a track uh, as much as I could, and then we found um, a singer to actually sing it, and um, that song became Shattered Love. That was like our first song that we did together, um, and we started um, giving it out to people in the D.C. area. So. You know, Sam, the man Burns, rest in peace, Jeffrey C., a bunch of people in the D.C. area, Mandrill, and they were playing it off tape in the clubs. And Jeffrey C. in Baltimore, you know, still out there making records, uh, actually gave it to Barry G. at Strictly Rhythm in New York to check these guys out. And we got the call from Barry G. like, or no, it wasn't Barry, it was George Morell who was the A&R at the time. And they were like, wow, we like this record. We want to sign it. We just want you to get a different singer. I forgot who was the singer, Janice? We had Janice first, Janice, right? Local yeah. singer, right? Yeah. And so while we were, you know, auditioning singers, one of whom was Lynn Lockamy, who also went to UVA with us. Well, not at the same time, but but later. Um, we were auditioning all kinds of singers, had Lynn audition. They didn't like Lynn. And um they eventually picked Brenda Braxton. Um, but while they were while we were trying to find the right singer, we started making other tracks and they started putting those out. And that was how we, you know, kind of got into it. And the name 95 North? Because we were always on 95 North going to sign, try to get records signed. Right. <laughs> Love it. Love right. it. Doug, Doug was Doug was in uh Richmond driving up 95 North to my townhouse uh in silver springs right outside of dc and then we were on the uh 
on 95 North going up to like the Sound Factory Bar on Wednesday nights to network with people, handing out cassettes and uh, seeing what the scene was like and that kind of thing. Tell people what the Sound Factory <laughs> Bar is. I'm sorry, what was that? Describe the Sound Factory Bar for someone that's never been there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that just an amazing club. You know, the Wednesday night party with Louis Vega was just, an insane party. I mean, that right. that was, I mean, obviously there were other people that played there, but we we used to go to the Wednesday night party with Louie. And, you know, he debuted all of the classic tracks in there. It was always packed. Um, right. You know. You see everybody in there. Yeah, Todd every, Terry, that's Rogers, right. MK, right. Lim Springsteen, uh, every, everybody. Everybody was in there. I mean, it was just like, it was like industry yeah. night, but it was... Right. I mean, my, my, I have two favorite memories. One, he had David Cole in there one night playing keys. And that was just mind blowing, you know? And then my second favorite memory is we actually had a chance to play in the funk hut. So, so we, so we, they, um, I think Lynn was performing uh, King Street or something like that. I right. can't remember. Yeah, we it was uh, Len and Philip, I believe. That's uh, right. We, we, had, we, we were real feeling pretty good. We had two acts on the bill, and we were playing downstairs, as Doug mentioned in the uh, yeah, cut. Yeah, it was cut. Yeah. So, right. yeah, but that was an amazing party. Um, tell, tell, talk to us about your production approach. How do you walk us through the process of producing a record from beginning? Actually, I want to take that a different direction. I want to do anatomy of a song. One of my favorite anthems is Jazz Ascension. Walk mm. me through how that song came together. <laughs> you you have to start it yeah, because um, there's a UVA connection. Right, another UVA connection, UVA University of Virginia, for those who don't know. And uh, uh, another classmate, well, not classmate, but another college mate of ours, uh, Lewis Anderson, affectionately known as Wheezy. Uh, you, in fact, I'm sure if you find any black person who went to UVA and you meet them and you ask, do you know Wheezy? They'll say, yeah. Regardless <laughs> so of when they came out. <laughs> regardless of when they came out, right. You know, anywhere from 1978 to 2018. But anyway, <laughs> um, and he is a, is a poet and he sent us a, a dat of his poems, uh, him, you know, reciting his poems. And we heard one of them uh, and it was... Um, uh, what was the name of the poem? Um, I can't remember the. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, we were listening to him. We were like, "Hey, I like the way he's talking about this," and uh, you know, doing like a musical analogy, talking about uh, a woman. And so we put the dad on and uh, put together the track that goes by behind it. Just had the chords basically, and we decided to like slow it down. To we, we dumped the vocals into uh, Cubase and then pitched his voice down a little more to give him more of a like this ominous, not ominous, but a cavernous kind of sound and everything. And it just worked out. Yeah. It just worked out. We also, that that was also the time when we just purchased the Nord lead module. So we were experimenting <laughs> with the different sounds that come out of it and, and um, the modulating synth and all of that. But yeah, it just, you know, <clears throat> Did did we go into a session saying, oh, yeah, we're going to make a song called Jazz Ascension and we're going to, you know, uh, find a uh, a cool vocal that talks about jazz. It, mm -mm. it was we heard just like Richard said, we heard this poem. We we're like, wow, that's that's pretty cool, you know, and let's just chop it up. You know, let's make a track and, you know, try to play around with it. And it just came together. Right. And, and for that track, uh, you know, the main version has the chords in it. I was trying to get something that's kind of ascending sort of and then ending on a chord you don't quite expect sort of thing. And uh, we decided to use the flute for the solo sound, but it was also backed, I think, with a sound from the vintage keys. So it was like a, a layered sound for that solo sound. And then when it came time for the dub, uh, Doug took over on that one and put that beat together. I think you came up with the baseline for that too. Uh, you no, know, you came up with the baseline for that, but we wanted something that was, you know, vibing. yeah, right. yeah. It's right. sort of in the vein of like some of the stuff that Armin van Helden was doing, right? We were going, <clears throat> we were heavily influenced by what was going on in England with Speed Garage and stuff like that. And so that was kind of the, 
what we were thinking when we did that and it people still play it today it's, it's a classic anatomy of another song all right with Mijan Owens huh. ah. <laughs> yeah so um we met Mijan through Sam the Man Burns um uh, so Mijan was in DC and you know Sam would always introduce us to artists that he thought we should work with and so he interest, he introduced us to Mijan um and in terms of the song you know I'm not sure so so I can't remember exactly how everything came together but we had her at Rich's place and we had Philip Eddie Nicholas, Carla Brown, and who else on backing vocals? Um, was that was or it, it, it might have been Majan? Yeah, just Majan, right? Yeah. Right. So right. we we had them here, and again, I don't, I can't remember. Well, you 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 had a. We decided we wanted to do like a gospel kind of song. Okay. So I, I just picked you know a standard like a seven chord gospel kind of uh, chord to go along. And Doug, you you came up with all the hooks. You sang like all the hooks that were supposed to be there. Yeah. Uh, so Doug wrote all the hooks. Like you, he'll make everything all right. You know. Right. And uh, yeah, so we made the right. hooks, and we had no, we we weren't interested in doing a, a verse chorus verse song. We literally wanted it to be ad lib. We wanted wanted Majan to just get in there and feel it and sing, you know, based on the music and the backing vocals, and so. We we recorded all the backing vocals. Nimajan got in the booth, and I can't remember. I don't. I'm not sure if it was one take or not. But yeah, no more than said, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just came in. Yeah. All of that stuff was off the top. Right. She all was vibing off of the the, the lyrics and the background vocals, and she just heard it, and then you know yeah. heard it, and and just just did it. Yep. Wow. I think That's the cool. only thing we may have directed is like the intro where she was talking right so you should you should you know do like a talking intro before you start singing right. but everything else was just like off the top right how do you know and, when to and, sorry go ahead and, and so for that song but we also knew that not everybody had like a black church gospel background so we came up with the other version but that was more of a you know the, the garagey kind of sound that we normally do and uh and for that one, we picked one of our favorite instruments uh, in the EPS 16 plus. There was this sound called the rock bass, which sounded like a live bass and had these extra things you could do with the mod. We got to do certain like slides and little, uh, accentuations and everything. So uh, we plucked up the key, uh, plucked up the bass line for that. And, and again, some chords that were sort of like, you know, kind of going up and down. And um, that version ended up being the one I think that got more widespread uh, play. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen YouTube videos of uh, different people playing it at festivals and in clubs and that kind of thing. But I do remember Danny Teneglia playing the gospel version down in Miami uh, when we were down wow. there. And people really liked that one, too. So. How do you know when a song is done? <laughs> They're never done. <laughs> yeah. We just said, that's it. We've got to leave it alone before we mess it up almost. Because uh, there's always something you hear. Later, I, I I can't think of maybe more than a couple of our records that I think. Ah, I wish we, we had done it. X. I wish we had done Y. Right. And a perfect example of that is this song we did called "Don't Go," um, mm -hmm. which we wrote and and actually recorded a version of it when we were in England for the first time in 1995. So we had a nice version of it and we got back to the States and we were like, nah, we need to make it a little bit more dramatic. We need to have a sax solo in it. Right. And, and so we came up with another version that was really long intro and sax solo and, you know, lots of drama in the song. And, and I think people liked it, but ironically, I can't tell you somehow the version we did in England, which was much more raw and straightforward. Someone got a, a hold of that and pressed it on an acetate. And I cannot tell you how many times people have said, when are you going to release that version? I don't even have that. I don't even have yeah. it. But people yeah. still, they 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 play, they they will message us and, and and play this snippet of Paul Trouble Anderson playing it on one of his radio shows. It's like, oh. where is this version? And when I hear it, I'm like, man, we should have left that alone. 
because yeah. it actually sounded good. It yeah. just said it was straight. It was, you know, it was, it was just a nice raw track, good chord, same chord progression, but just, right. you know, it was done. It, it was actually done. We could have, could have just done that and not put all this other stuff in it. Yeah. So one more song, Anatomy, please. Yep. Sabrina Pope, My Life. Yeah. So, ah. So Sabrina actually wasn't she on All Right? Didn't she come down in? Uh... No, she wasn't on All Right. No. Okay. Um, she, she, no, no, she she only came down for. Uh, uh, what was the one we had? Everybody from Jersey coming down. What, which record was that? They all stayed in the in the living room. Um, that was all. That was my life. We had. That was uh, my life. Yeah, okay. we had. Remember, we had Philip. We had her. We had Sabrina. I forgot who else we had. Right. Uh, and I Chris forgot Flowers how we was connected. with them, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I forgot how we connected with her. I think we connected with her because she sang background on something else. On that Hold we on. Right. That was on it. Hold on. Well, she, well, she sang it. She, and she ended up doing it. Right. Yeah. Right. She had, eventually did the song. And so we were doing a follow up. And so we we had her down. I wrote the I wrote the lyrics and the melody. And, you know, we had the, the track and it came together, you know, it yeah. just came together. And and I always tell people an interesting thing. If you listen to that song, I think at about uh, six minute or so mark in there, if you listen to her ad lib, she's singing, uh, I'm running out of things to say. She's like, I'm running out of things to say. And Doug and I didn't realize that until <laughs> she was gone. And what happened was, because normally when we recorded uh, vocals, you know, we'd have them go through, sing the verse, everything, you know, coach a few things here. And then we'd go in and tell them to punch in on uh, harmonizing on certain words, everything. Then we would just take a couple of passes, just tell them, just, just add them. Just mm -hmm. add them, just, just sing whatever comes to your head. Let the track run, take the main vocals out. And she was going along and, you know, we were like, yeah, yeah, oh, oh yeah. You know, we just listened to the feel. And later on, we realized she was saying it. So we left it in. <laughs> yeah, we, we just left it in. it in. So yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. This question is from Kai in Germany. Discuss the Baltimore club sound. What it, what it, what was it, and what is it now? So that that's really like that. That is its own sort of separate genre right. in Baltimore, right? It's 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 like a more sample based, um, syncopated type of music, right? It's it. I mean, you in Baltimore there. You know, in, in some occasions, you would play that in a regular house set, but it was definitely more more syncopated, more sample based. A lot of it based on the break from um, "Think" by Lynn Collins, right. chopping that up and making a bunch of beats based on that. Um, and you know, it, it just became a big hit in Baltimore. And ironically, now people call that the New Jersey sound. Because somehow it migrated up to New Jersey, and all these producers in New Jersey started to latch onto it, and they call it the Jersey sound. It's nothing but Baltimore. It's Baltimore Club. That's all it is. Miss Tony right. and and um, who else? Frank Ski and and right. and any number of people. Yeah, definitely its own its own uh, genre. And, yeah, uh, it had its own nights and clubs and yep. everything else. Right. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't like something that you would hear like in like a basement boy set, right? You know, if they're playing right. The right. paradox, it's it's its own separate thing. Define soulful house. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, uh, it's kind of like one of those things that it's hard to define, but you know it when you hear it. Uh, but in, in general terms, uh, something with more of uh, R and B ish kind of roots, kind of a uh, you know, with the the melodies, with the chords, with the uh, rhythms. Um, I, I can't. How do you put it in words, Doug? How do you put it? In, if you had to describe, I mean, I, think, I mean, I mean, it's 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 like to me, like R and B based house. I mean dance music right it, i mean it's it has its roots in stuff from the 70s you know music made by roy ayers and 
music that came out of Philadelphia and, right. you know, all of this stuff that if you grew up in the tri-state area, you listen to on WBLS. I mean, a lot of the old club music yeah. and Sal Soul. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, so like it's West End. It's, yeah. yeah. And, but yeah, it's just, it's more on the soulful end. It, it, you know, a lot of the songs have vocals, they're jazz influences, you know, disco influences, I mean, you know, I don't know that there's any one sound that epitomizes uh, soulful house music. I mean, I would consider what Larry Heard does, a lot of his stuff, to be soulful. And yet it sounds nothing like what Blaze does, right? Um, it's just kind of this feeling, too, that it evokes that's, you know, just just different, right? And I, and I would say, from a technical standpoint, musically, uh you'll hear like either like a lot of like gospel kind of chords or um what else uh or like jazzy kind of chords like major sevens major ninths minor sevens minor ninths uh, you don't just hear simple uh, tri uh triads like you know c c chord f g c f g. it's going to be like a c7 or, or a c major seven that kind of thing so musically it's going to be more like that even verging on like you know jazzy progressions and sometimes Another question from Kai. Uh, do you do either of you listen to Amapiano coming out from South Africa? And what are your thoughts on that genre? So I'm just getting hip to it. I I, you know, I I've seen people talk about that as a style that they play. Um, and I didn't know what it meant, but it's it's just seems like, you know, sort of down tempo um afro type house music. Right. Mm -hmm. So something in the 110 to 115 range, which I think is great. I mean, I, 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 I love playing at that tempo. Right. I think a lot of stuff, you know, there, there's just a lot of stuff in that sort of tempo range that fits oh, in. Man. And so this is, is a nice uh, addition to that lane and kind of helps you to build your setup. And I, I like a lot of it. You know, it sounds really cool. Another question from Kai. Uh, who, if anyone, mentored you in the business? Hmm. Um, well, for and me, it's really, it's really about question about like the role of mentors in DJ culture, right? Uh, um, well, well, production wise, uh, I mean, as far as uh, people like actually, no, I mean, obviously there were influences, you know, but as far as people we actually interacted with. Um, as far as mentoring us, um, I mean, like for me personally, uh, there was a guy named Irvin Lee who, uh, who like mentored me. I went to him before, actually even before I started doing house music uh, on the first record that I did. But I would take him other things, demos that I was doing. Uh, he would give me encouragement, you know, and tell me certain things to do. Um, mentorship wise, uh, who would you say? Uh, well, I mean, I, I Rich is is my mentor because I knew nothing about production until, you know, he, I mean, re really didn't know. I mean, when we even when we were doing rap music, my my contribution was, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Sample this, yeah, let's do that. And you know, when we really started to get serious about house music, he was the one that taught me how to navigate a sampling keyboard, how to make sequences, how to come up with beats, how to, you know, pluck out a, a simple bass line, right? Um, and from there, I bought my own keyboard and was able to develop a little bit more as a producer. So, you know, I count Rich as a mentor in that regard. DJ mentors, you know, um, um, so, you know, I started a long time ago in the 80s um you know my exposure to DJing was people in my high school um one of my friends uh Maurice Caldwell he goes by the name DJ Spark he certainly was one um you know um people in college you know Oris Stewart you know well-known DJ in college Brian Weddington I mean these are obviously not household names but these are people that you know I learn by observing and just kind of absorbing their styles. Uh, probably my biggest 
DJ mentor for house music is one of my friends named Bruce Berry. He he's the one that really, you know, really made it mean something to me at a time when I was a straight hip hop head and just didn't have any interest in that kind of dance music. And, you know, he encouraged me to go to this club in New Jersey called Club 88 in East Orange, New Jersey. DJ Burt was the DJ. And that was the that was the turning point for me. And then once I started getting into it, you know, playing with him and and just seeing what he was playing and how he was playing it, my friend Bruce, like it, you know, a lot of what I do today, I picked up from him just in those early days of me being a house music DJ, so. Tell us about Club 88. Yes. Um, you know, obviously not the biggest name club on, on the map, but a well-known club in New Jersey, right? Um, DJ Burt, again, was the DJ. Um, a lot of college kids used to go there, right? I think most people in, in, in New Jersey were going to Zanzibar or some of the other, you know, more well-known spots. But that was the spot for me. That was where I got... Um, what I'll, what I'll say, my my house music baptism, because it it you know even though it was it catered to more of a youngish crowd, a college crowd, DJ Burt played like like all the other well known DJs, like Tony Humphreys, like you know Morales, like Levan, in that he played old and new, and just played in a style that that was just common for clubs at the time, but it wasn't, wasn't anything that I was super familiar with. And it was mind blowing for me in part because he was playing songs that I remember from the radio, but, you know, being a, a hardcore hip hop head, knucklehead, I was, had no appreciation for, but I get into this club and I hear him playing and I hear him using effects and, and, and playing songs at, you know, not from the beginning, but starting at the break and playing it from the break all the way through. I mean, it was transformational. It, it made me, I was like, wow. Some songs I thought were brand new. That's how naive I was. I remember hearing Just As Long As I Have You. I thought that was a new song. I was like, wow, when did this song came out? come out? You know, and at that point it was like 10 years old, you know? So it was, again, it was an experience that was, transformational for me even though it wasn't like you know I, I mean I know people mention club 88 when they think of you know known clubs in New Jersey but it wasn't like you know the club that most people mention they mentioned Zanzibar and, and other places from Adam Cruz if you were to look back at the contracts you signed in terms of your earliest releases on emotive cult Henry Street strictly rhythm etc what would you have insisted on adding revising or removing before you signed <laughs> make them all master uh not purchases but leases 10 even 15 years and all re rights revert back to us and we didn't do that that's the biggest regret because you know they basically purchased it and we even looked through all of our contracts to see did any of them kind of not do that well i think we found a couple that didn't do that and then we were trying to see if we could get through the loophole of uh them not uh accounting for you know the future of uh, streaming and digital sales and some of them were always smart enough that good lord you're smart enough you know we have the rights to you know vinyl cassettes cds and any form not even invented yet <laughs> so they That's had right. all and, and they would even say we retain all rights like throughout the universe so i guess they're anticipating in case we ever go to the moon and start selling records on the moon they would still get the uh rights to it so that's the that's the biggest thing was that you know because that you fifty percent of the publishing. What did you say it again? That that and giving up fifty percent of the publishing in all our songs. Um, no, actually, uh, we we did okay for the most part on that because um, we kept all of the songwriters publishing and then half of the publishers publishing. So out of the whole pie, we got seventy five percent of the pie for the yeah publishing. But I don't. But, we, yeah, I'm not sure I would give up 50% today, even, you know, even if yeah. we do have 75%. Yeah. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, because if we had said, you know, 
hey, uh, you can lease it for 20 years even, let's say. We have no idea, you know, they probably would have gone for it. Like, you know, hey, well, okay, 20 years, and yeah, this isn't going to do anything. Let them have it. We'd have all of our records back now. Yep. But, um, we, we could did. put out our own compilation. We could do all of that. And do everything with it, get all the, yep. you know, sales, you know, under the classic sales category and, and everything else. But uh, yep. it is what it is. <laughs> if we had the money, I know some artists like um, Todd Edwards and uh, somebody else, I think, they bought their rights back to their catalog. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not sure the whole process that they went through and it must have had the dollars to do it um, and got control of the catalogs again. Yeah, so. Another question. You could have continued pursuing deals with other labels, but at some point you decided to launch your own 95 North Records. Why and what have you learned from owning your own record label? Um, I think, um, well, again, it was part of the idea was to have more control, right? So, you know, even at that point, we were like, well, you know, we have enough of a name. We don't necessarily need, um, you know, a label to push us as long as we have, uh, we're aligned with a distributor, you know, or, um, you know, another label. We have a deal with another label that can do the the marketing for us. So it was, you know, the idea was just to try to build our own label, have more control. You know, um, I think we were definitely inspired by, um, you know, the sulfuric guys. You know, they stepped off really early and did their own thing and they became hugely hugely successful with their distribution deal through through Northcott so we were hoping to duplicate that uh there's an ongoing hobby versus career debate about producing and DJing but both of you have done well pursuing other career opportunities while continuing with your creative endeavors what's your take um for me um it, I prefer it as a hobby. Um, I, I, we did it full time for a couple of years. You know, we pursued it. We did the best we could. There were any number of reasons why um, it didn't work out. Life circumstances and, you know, a change in the sound, what have you. But I know that at the tail end of us doing it full time, um, I just got tired of having to go into my studio to make music, to make money it was the only source of income. And so it was like, okay, I'm not actually in here making music because I want to do it. I'm in here because I need to sell a track so I can pay my mortgage. And at that point, you know, when the inspiration is something other than you just loving the music, for me personally, it just didn't have the same meaning. And so, you know, I, I much prefer it as a hobby because then I get to do whatever I want. I don't have to make a certain kind of music. I don't have to play a certain kind of music. I don't have to chase gigs. I can do play gigs when I want, <clears throat> where I want on my own terms. And so, you know, do I miss out on playing, you know, overseas and all of these big gigs and the festivals? I mean, it would be nice to do that, but, you know, we had our opportunity to do some of that and that was enough for me. And, if it happens again, great. If it doesn't, I'm okay with that too. But at the end of the day, I'm reminded that I didn't start DJing to get money. And I certainly didn't start to make music to make money. I did it because I enjoyed doing it. It was pretty much the same for me. Um, you know, we, it was always a goal to be able to say we're doing it full time. I still remember we were flying to uh we were flying to London. Uh, we're getting ready to do some gigs over there. And, you know, it was the first time you have to fill in the uh, the form that says, what's your profession? And I was able to write down music producer, you know, and it, it felt good to do that. And the first year or so, uh, everything was going along fine for the, for the most part, uh, putting out stuff, uh, creating and everything. And then the second year, things kind of changed a little bit. And as Doug mentioned, it started to be sort of like, you know, I wouldn't say survival mode, but um, we we did get a decent amount for one of our records, uh, Bring Back the Love. That helped uh, uh, push things a little bit further. But the market was kind of changing. Labels in the U.S. were starting to pay less a little bit. Uh, things were just kind of changing. And then also, you know, uh, 
we had, you know, family responsibilities, each of us too. And it's sort of like, if you know, you've got something else that can provide for your family a little bit better than what you're doing on this other side, then you got to kind of do what you need to do. And, you know, it's, the music business is ups and downs, ups and downs. It's a question of how long can you hold on to the downs before the up will come? And, you know, who knows? Maybe an up was right around the corner or another year away, or maybe not. And, you know, there's no regrets or, you know, we were proud that we could do it full time and proud of our catalog that we created part time. And um, so I always say things happen the way they're supposed to happen. I agree. I agree. There's a glamorized view of DJing and performing around the world, but we seldom hear about the pitfalls of touring and traveling. What was the worst thing about traveling and touring during the times when you were receiving a lot of attention for your releases? <laughs> uh, missing the flight because the driver overslept. And then we had to, uh, we were in Italy. And I think the guy at the front desk maybe knew Spanish or something. And Doug was trying to speak to him and his broken Spanish, that Spanish. And, you know, that was before cell phones, and before everything else. And so we're trying to get in contact with the promoter and everything. And so they finally got somebody for us. Uh, they rushed us to some airport. You and, missed the flight. Uh, hmm? they, they, they picked us up late. We went to the airport where we were supposed to catch our flight plane had already left right. so our next option was to drive three hours to milan to, right to and catch a flight back to the uk the uk right that and if we had missed that flight we would have missed our flight back to the u.s right yeah and i mean the driver he was i was kind of peeking at the uh speedometer and uh he was he was pushing it yeah <laughs> it was like 90 and i don't mean 90 kilometers i mean 90 miles an hour and uh and then we had to buy the ticket ourselves you know and, and hope to get reimbursed later oh, but we, we had to like doug mentioned if we missed that we would have missed our flight to get back home and it just a whole you know chain reaction of things so um but i think that, oh good no that, that was it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think beyond that it's you know it it's a grind i mean it does look glamorous you go into all these wonderful nightclubs but you're generally going out super late all the clubs are smoky you might play two to three gigs a night. Um, you you get back to your place where you're staying at five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. You sleep all day, wake up in the afternoon, you know, and try to get yourself back in gear for the next gig. And it's exhausting. I mean, it is, it is literally exhausting. Um, I still remember that same trip that Richard is talking about. I mean, we... You know, again, it's very cool to do these gigs, but, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, by the time money comes around, I don't know how you have energy to do anything. I mean, it's just, it, it it's just a lot of stress. Um, and, you know, my hat's off to those guys that do it every weekend. I just don't know how they do it. Now, there, there is one caveat, though, is that. Well, yeah, there is. I mean, the style of music that we're doing does not pay the same as like, you know, back at that time, like the equivalent of like the EDM-ish type stuff. So, you know, the accommodations that we were staying in were not five-star hotels, you know, it was that, you know, with someone's apartment maybe. Um, and as Doug mentioned, you know, uh, the, the gigs, you know, we would get a driver, have a driver taking us. And the cars in the UK are kind of small and I had to carry my keyboard as well. So sometimes Doug and I are sitting in the back seat with the keyboard laid across our thighs. <laughs> because the car is too small to put the uh, keyboard in the trunk. <laughs> so uh, we, we did have one driver though. He had like a mid-sized car. We we're like, ah, oh, yes. You know, and we were able to, you know, spread out. But, um, you know, and, and to Doug's point, you know, there was one time we, we had a gig, I don't know, maybe like at 11 o'clock or so. It was like at a bar kind of thing, which actually was one of my favorite gigs. The people there liked it. It was small, but people liked it. Then we had to drive from London to, I think like Sheffield, like two hours up for another gig. And then after that was over, come back to London and we played at, um, not the Hippodrome, um, uh, it's like the theater, one of the theaters there. Uh, we went on like at 6 a.m. So oh, I mean, that was a that was a full night, that particular yeah. night. You know? Right. And so, you know, you're, you're getting back, it's bright outside. Right. <laughs> you know, you're not in, you're not, I mean, again, we, we weren't, we weren't balling like some of, 
these other big DJs right. we're staying with friends. So we're not right. posted up in some nice hotel, right? With air conditioning and room service. No. 400 count sheets. That's right. We're, we're, every day. We're, yeah. we're, in, we're in somebody's twin bed. Yeah. No air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it was fun. It was definitely it was fun. fun. We, we, we definitely yeah. liked it. But, uh, but yeah, if there was an extra zero at the end of our uh, pay on those gigs, that would have made a slight Quite a difference. difference. Right. Right. Yeah. What are some of the things, uh, best things you've learned about maintaining a work-life balance? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, what do you mean like doing music and uh, yeah, doing doing music and then having like a like a regular life? Uh, honestly, when we were in the thick of things back in the nineties, it was it was difficult. It yeah. was quite a few. Are y'all done yet? What time? Are you, we're gonna be late for this. We were supposed to go to here. We're, you know. It was kind of hard to, to, there was definitely some conflicts. And, um, you know, that's why uh, Doug and I, uh, when, when uh, like younger people come to us and say, you know, I'm looking for advice on getting to the business or what it takes, you know, and we say, well, you may not want to be in a relationship starting off. Uh, if you're not in one, don't get in one because you're going to need to really, really, if you're really trying to make it, you have to like really be focused, uh, constantly working on your craft, going out networking, making stuff uh and and your mind has to be like this is what you know i want to do and if yeah. you are with someone they're going to have to understand that that you know things may get thrown off while you're trying to make it you know until you get to the position where you make other people adjust around you you're going to have to adjust around the people that you need to make it you know so um that's to to, to maintain a work life balance if you're you know really trying to break in and everything it it can be hard and even if you get in uh, now you're busy you're successful. Yeah. So you got to go to this gig. You got to fly to here. You're going overseas to DJ and everything. So it, it, it's it's difficult to to do. And you'd have to be with someone who's really uh, understanding of that lifestyle. Yeah. And and I think that that's true. If you're if your aim is to be a well-known producer right. or you know, traveling right. and stuff like that, if you if you're just putting out records on occasion, well, then you're like me and Rich now. <laughs> Right. No problem. Basically, right. Yeah, it's no problem. You know, we, right. uh, you know, it's the balance is I'm focused on my job. And then when I have time on the weekends or here and there, I might work on a few tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. What are your thoughts on streaming music and the value we place on music today? Oh, I just had this debate with my girls. Because, <laughs> and, and actually my wife was having a debate with her colleagues because you know, my wife works with a bunch of younger people and they were getting on her case about why she doesn't have Spotify. She still buys things through iTunes. You know, my daughter was in, and she was, she was, you know, talking about it in her, um, in our family group chat. She was saying, you know, they're giving me shit at work because I don't have Spotify. You know, I don't want to have Spotify. And my girls were like, but it's so much cheaper. And, and I said, yeah, it's so much cheaper because you really don't care about the artists that you claim to support. You know, if you really cared about them, you go out and actually buy the product. So, so, so y'all are just a bunch of cheap mofos. But anyway, you know, for, 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 yeah. you know, it, it, I just have a different, I don't, I don't, I still don't stream. I see that I understand the value in it you know, it's cost effective, you have access to this huge library of music. But I come from a world where having the tangible item means something. I still have all my records in my record room. You know, there was something about buying a vinyl record, reading the liner notes, knowing who, who produced what, right, who wrote what. And I don't know that you really get that. I mean, maybe you get that in some metadata, or something like that but these kids aren't looking at that yeah. and, and i just don't think i don't think it fosters an appreciation for the music and how it's made and what goes into it um I, I just don't think it does that it's just it basically turns music into you know another cheap commodity you know like buying fast fast fashion at h m or something like that you know, you like it for a little bit, but then you just kind of toss it aside, you know. My, my my biggest pet peeve with it is like with Spotify, the royalty rates, 
You know, I could understand when they were first starting up, you know, they had to set everything up, their networks, the marketing, getting the catalogs, so all of this initial startup case uh, cost and everything. The same thing like when CDs came out, you know, you had the factories, they had to get the manufacturing plants up, but they've been running along for a while now. They are making loads of profit and there's no reason why they can't increase the uh, royalty per stream from, you know, that fraction of a penny to, you know, at least a half a penny or a penny or something like that. And because they've already recouped back all of their costs to set everything up. And I know that the record companies are, you know, taking a chunk with the licensing and everything, but there's still enough money. I, I, I did the math one time. I forgot how, you know, with the number of uh, subscribers they have and the, the uh, subscription fees, what they cost, that they have to have the money to be able to pay better than what they're paying you you shouldn't have your song get streamed you know a million times and you get you know two thousand dollars you know yeah. yeah that's my biggest thing i mean it is convenient i mean i i have apple music but i still buy you know house music like from track source uh and i mean i've at my age now i've pretty much bought you know most of all the music um, the majority of music i want to buy and then i hear new artists every once in a while i'll get something you know but as far as uh, the convenience of having, you know, the streaming service is fine, but just pay the artist a better royalty than what you're doing. There's, there's no reason you don't need to. This question is for Doug, also from Adam Cruz. Uh, Doug, you're currently hosting a weekly party. What's different about holding down a DJ residency today as compared to when you, you were one of the residents at Club Red? Oh, um... Great question. Well, uh, one, I have to go to work the next day. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so there's that. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I think, well, you know, I mean, I'm joking, but that is true. But it's a different scene today, a different group of people. And um, unfortunately, you know, all the people that I used to play for 20 years ago are have aged out, right? And so now the challenge is to try to attract a new crop of people to this music while maintaining my integrity, right? Back in back when I was at Red, guaranteed packed house every Saturday night, 12 to 6 a.m., right? Uh and you know it, it it was it sold itself now we're especially with the pandemic you know we're now post pandemic people are still a little bit hesitant about going out to some venues and again it's you know my gig is now on a sunday night so you know who are the people that want to come out and and party on a sunday night till one and two o'clock in the morning we're still trying to figure that that part out um the good thing is that i'm playing for the same person i played for 20 years ago and his dedication to the music is unwavering so whether there are two people there or 200 people there he's going to continue to do what he does on sunday night he doesn't compromise and he gives you the freedom to do to play whatever you want to play um and so that part of it hasn't changed. Having that freedom to kind of do what I want to do, play what I want to play, hasn't changed. It's just now trying to build up the audience and 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 try to recapture, you know, at least some of what used to happen on Sunday nights, especially when when Sam was here. And that's the other big thing, right? Sam Burns is not with us anymore. Sam Burns is the ultimate unifier of the DC house music scene. And we don't have that unifying force anymore, right? He he could appeal to the oldest of the old heads from the 70s and the youngest raver. He welcomed them all in. He didn't compromise for anyone, but he welcomed them all in to his world. Um, and we don't have that unifying force anymore. And that's, that's hard. Question for both of you. What do you want your legacy to be? Hmm. <sighs> uh, I, I, I mean, I, I would say just that uh, we made records that made 
people feel something that made them dance or made them forget their troubles at some point or enable them to have a good time. Uh, hopefully them hearing our records now, maybe take them back to a certain special time in life, just like when I hear certain records, I can go right back to where I was at that time. And uh, that we just tried to make good music. Yeah. I think, you know, if we can be recognized as having made some contribution to house music, that that would be great. And we get reminded of that a lot. There are times <clears> that I don't, you know, think, oh, we we're just a blip on the scene. But you go read a comment on a YouTube video or you get a reach out on Instagram or Facebook or something like that, where someone says, you know, um, your music is fantastic and this particular record changed my life. And, you know, we've got records that are almost 30 years old that people are still playing. No, no joke. People are still playing things that we made in 1995. I think that means we have some, you know, some kind of legacy in the scene. We may not be, you know, at the top of the house pyramid, but, you know, we're also not unknown. And for me, um, you know, this is, this is not something that I aspire to do professionally at all. It just kind of happened. And so I'm just grateful for having had the opportunity to, to even do something like this. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it really is. It's just amazing. Even with our, you know, relatively, you know, relatively limited success. I mean, to, to, to have just done it by happenstance and have the rep that we have 30 years later is amazing. And, and the, uh, I, no matter how many times I see it, when I see a crowd dancing to uh, a record that we've made, it's one of the best feelings. Uh, someone yeah. sent a video or a clip from a video uh, posted on Facebook of some big party, I think it was in London, and the person dropped. Um, uh, Sunday shouting. Sunday shouting, Sunday yeah. shouting, right. And he, he was like bringing it in and then when it, it hit in and the crowd just going crazy and everything. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, you, you're thinking, but that's something we made in the basement, you know, right. And it has that kind of effect and, and you can get that kind of reaction out of people. That means that you're connecting with them as well. Something you made is connecting with someone else to make them have that kind of reaction. And it's, it's, it's a great feeling. And, and something that we made 23 years ago. Right. 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 So, so imagine that a record that's 23 years old, that still gets played, that still generates royalties that, you know, we still get recognition for. I mean, right. that's, that's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. I know that clip. I think that's Jamie Jones, uh, Ibiza, uh, yep. I think it's last record. I yep. think I, I tagged you guys on Facebook with that song. Yeah, it was great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. But, yeah. but it ha it happens more than than I ever imagined. I I was just on Instagram the other day and I got tagged in a set that somebody was playing and they played the person played "Let Yourself Go" from on Cult, which we did right. in like 1994. Yeah, at, yeah. At, you know, in the midst of all this other new music, and I and and then I got also got tagged by somebody that made a remix of it. You know, oh, you know, here's a, you know, we updated it. We made this remix. Oh, thank you so much for the inspiration. Yeah. It's amazing. Wow. It's amazing stuff. You, know, you, you just reminded me uh, uh, about, you were mentioning what regrets we had contract wise. Uh, and one that we have is, uh, I wish some kind of way we could have used the word, the name 95 North for Sunday Shouting. Because <laughs> a lot of people didn't even know that we did it. They see Johnny right. Corporate and they, you know, unless they read the credits, they don't know that oh. we're the ones that did it. So that's that, right. that ended up why, being why like you, the biggest record. So why did you make that pivot from Johnny Corbett to 95 North for that record? Uh -huh, because at that time we had stopped doing music full time and we were working stiffs. So we, it was a play. It was to represent our new status as like no longer full time music producers. Right. Johnny Corporate right. working right. stiffs. It was actually the second release under that. Uh, that's right. Right. Because uh, we, we literally did, right? Right when we had to go back to work and we did the record for uh, Tommy, uh, the first one, we said, call it Johnny Corporate. You know, so then we wanted a follow up. 
And but yeah, if we had the name 95 North attached to it, that would have made who knows some whatever difference. But uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. And the last question for the evening: What advice do you have for the next generation? <laughs> um, you know, try to try to carve out your own lane. You know, um, take some time and learn your craft. Don't just spit out a bunch of nonsense. You know, I mean, it's I, I see a lot of stuff on track source that it's literally just someone taking an old record and adding some beats underneath and they put it out. Like, you know, you might get a little bit of credit for that, but, you know, listen, study your craft, learn how to play an instrument, right? Be proficient at that. Study, you know, look at, listen to other artists, you know, take your time with it. Um, and, you know, just try to be the best musician and producer you can be, you know, so that when you put something out, it, it stands out. It's not like you aping somebody else's record. And I, I, I uh, everything that Doug said, uh, but I think that uh, like when you're first starting out, you do have to kind of go through, uh, I mentioned on another interview, the, the three I's, the letter I, which is uh, imitate, because you don't know what you're doing at first. So you want to try to learn how to do it. So just find a record you like and just see if you can imitate it. See if you can do the same kind of beats, get the same kind of sounds. You might even put something else out that sort of sounds like something. But then you move on to incorporate where, okay, now I'm going to kind of put some of my stuff in, maybe incorporate something on this record and this one and this one and kind of put something together. And then now you move on to another level. And then finally, you can move to the level of innovate. So now I know how to do all this stuff. I know how to find my sounds. I know how to EQ. I know how to put a uh, break together. I know how to arrange a song. Now, what can I do that's different from what everybody else is doing? And then, but yet you still have to have some connection to what is happening. I mean, if you go way left field, you're going to stay out there. So you you got to have to, you know, like you think about uh, Timberland, you know, when he came out with the beats that he came out with, nobody was doing it. But it was innovative, but yet there was something about it through people that uh, pulled people in. You know, you think with the Neptunes, when they came up with their sound, it was like pulling in, you know, some influences and all, but it was still innovative the way they were doing things. So you have to kind of graduate through those levels. Uh, so for someone that's first starting, you know, look at what other people are doing to learn how a record is put together, how instruments are put together, how things are arranged. And, you know, because I remember with us, like we would count okay, how many bars for the intro before the verse should come in? This record said 32 bars, so let's make ours 32 bars. Then you put the verse in, and then of course, and then where's the breakdown, you know, using it like as a map. Still for our song, our song, you know, but then, you know, we started doing things where we would incorporate, and then we did some records that were, you know, kind of left field that still, you know, did pretty good. And um, so that's the advice I would give, you know, for someone starting or trying to, uh, get better and better at producing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate both your time. Uh, it'll be live in about a month. And then um, for DJ Bookings, do you have a 95 North at Gmail they can contact you for festivals? Um, yeah, you can you can reach out to me on Instagram at, you know, at 95 underscore North. Perfect. Um, and I do have a Gmail account. It's my alter ego, DJ Smitty D at gmail.com perfect um, or you know reach out to me on facebook um or doug at 95 north.net that's another email address so happy to take bookings just let me know awesome thank you so much guys it's great to catch up as always yes sounds good take care all right all right take care appreciate it appreciate it yep. thank, thank you. you so much thank you Bye.